Hello. My name is Crystal Dahl, and I am the online communications specialist here at Meritas. I would like to welcome and thank each of you for joining us on today's webinar, White Collar Crimes in Indo-U.S. Context, Do's and Don'ts. Before we get started, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. Meritas now offers the ability to listen to our webinars through your computer speakers. If at any time you have any difficulty hearing the presentation, you may call into the associated telephone line instead. All lines will be muted. If you experience any technical difficulties, please press star zero at any time to connect with a support technician. Since you will be muted, if you have a question, please ask via the chat feature found on the left-hand side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And lastly, in the next few days, I will distribute a copy of the presentation, a recording of the webinar, as well as each of the presenter's contact details. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming two groups of presenters coming from two Meritas member firms on opposite sides of the globe. Coming from India, we have a group from um, Meritas member firm Ketan & Co. Ketan & Co. is one of India's largest full-service law firms. They have a dedicated U.S. desk and have created a cross-practice team for dealing with white-collar crimes stemming from the increasing domestic and global regulatory scrutiny and its consequent impact on business. And from the U.S., we have our New Jersey member affiliate, Norris McLaughlin and Marcus. NMM is a full-service firm that handles complex corporate matters, civil litigation, and criminal issues for clients ranging in size from Fortune 500 companies to individuals. With that, Sushmit, are you ready to get started? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Crystal, uh, for the kind introduction and uh, providing us with this platform to share some interesting thoughts on the white collar issues that are relevant to the Indo-US context. Everyone, welcome to this webinar. The discussions today are meant to help us understand the white collar crimes legal framework in India and US and discuss uh, best practices and uh, some do's and don'ts for minimizing potential risks. We have broken down today's program into three broad segments. In the first segment, Ketan & Co. will provide us with an overview of the Indian legal framework. In the second segment, Norris, McLaughlin, and Marcus will provide us with the U.S. legal framework relevant to white-collar issues. And in the last segment, we will open the floor, as Crystal said, to the audience for an interactive questions and answers session. So let's move on to this webinar's first segment. The government in India has adopted a pro-business and growth-centric stance, from modernizing our archaic labor laws to aligning corporate governance standards to international best practices. There is an ongoing push to weed out corruption from public life, ensuring ease of business, and also creating a level playing field. Companies in India and the US need to be aware of the several laws and regulations that need to be complied with to effectively manage compliance related risks. The bar on corporate governance has also been substantially increased and India's Companies Act, which is uh, now come in 2013, uh, also provides for serious sanctions for corporate fraud. We've also witnessed a recent spurt in wide-ranging wide prosecutions involving some of the high-profile corporate groups, key management personnel, uh, which makes it absolutely crucial to understand the universe of white-collar crimes in India. In our experience, uh, issues pertaining to bribery, corporate fraud, insider trading, and money laundering tend to come up more frequently and we will be focusing on these in a fair bit of detail today. Like in most developing countries globally, bribery is a big concern in India as well. As uh, I alluded to earlier, 
the prosecutions are on the rise under the Prevention of Corruption Act, OCA for short, against public officials and private individuals. Also, foreign nationals, maybe either as beneficiaries, intermediaries, principals, or agents. Foreign principals, investors, nationals have been investigated, and some of them have also been tried for bribery offenses. OCA in itself is very wide in scope and does not provide for any bright line defenses. So there are no exceptions to illegal gratification or abuse of office. Of late, uh, bribery scandals have plagued several landmark Indo-US engagements, such as Louis Berger International, Walmart Stores Inc., which are cases in point. Uh, in this context, therefore, proper risk mitigation systems become critical to ensure that the organization or its key personnel are not held accountable for the wrongdoings of any of their employees. As a general rule, companies are advised to steer clear of any shortcuts while exploring opportunities in India. 2013, India revised its corporate laws framework and adopted the New Companies Act that provides for strict go corporate governance standards. These include criminal sanctions for breach, thereby intensifying the potential downside to non-compliance. The Act has brought in a set of liabilities on companies and its management. Therefore, it becomes critical to clearly define roles and responsibilities of senior management, as well as establish systems to detect any lapse that may have happened. Foremost, the Act has considerably broadened the definition of fraud to include any act, omission, concealment of any fact, or abuse of position with an intent to deceive, to gain undue advantage, or to injure the interests of the company or its shareholders or its creditors. The offense of fraud can be implicated in a variety of circumstances, including tax evasion, securities fraud, bribery, data privacy, etc. It covers a wide range of persons. Even foreign companies and nationals can be prosecuted for fraud. Incidentally, as we speak, the government has proposed certain amendments to the Companies Act as well. There has been also a consistent push in India to weed out fraud from securities market and help create a robust stock market. Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI for short, which is the regulator to regulate stock markets, has come out with a new set of regulations to curtail insider tra trading, which anyway is punishable as fraud under the Companies Act. These 2015 regulations are applicable both to listed entities and those that propose to be listed. The regulations have broadened the scope of terms such as unpublished, price-sensitive information, insider, and connected person. Insider is widely defined to mean anyone having access to unpublished, price-sensitive information, and the person bears the heavy burden of defending an action. On a practical note, though, the board of directors may communicate sensitive information in limited situations when it is in the best interest of the company. For instance, the regulations allow the board to release sensitive information for a due diligence when the transaction is considered to be in company's best interest. The concept of trading plans, off-market transfers between promoters, and restricted exchange of sensitive information are also recognized. Money laundering, again, is a very serious concern in India, primarily because of the existence of a large gray economy that impacts tax collection, social policies, and other development work, like building national assets. Policy behind the governing legislation, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the MLA for short, is to basically disincentivize criminal activity by nullifying the economic benefit a criminal activity generates. So the Act empowers enforcement agencies, which is the Enforcement Directorate, to attach proceeds of crime and ultimately to confiscate these properties that rest ultimately in the state. Under PMLA, if prosecution is launched for an offense, say corporate fraud or bribery, there is an automatic trigger for initiating investigation and attaching proceeds of crime. It includes both tangible as well as intangible property. Properties situated outside India can also be attached on mere suspicion. 
foreign companies and nationals can be prosecuted under PMLA as well. In particular, PMLA casts reporting obligations, continuous uh, obligation on financial institutions to report suspicious transactions, so they are required to maintain systems to detect these. So in summary, I would like to mention the key takeaways for the audience. Given the very serious implications of criminal proceedings in India for companies, promoters, and other key management personnel, we highly recommend some best practices that can be adopted straight away. It's imperative for the senior management to communicate the right message to employees about the ethos of the organization and also zero tolerance attitude towards non-compliance with company policies and uh, SOPs. Create, creation of clear reporting and escalation systems within the organization is also very important. As a general principle, companies should avoid certain things like cash transactions, casual meetings with public officials, or offering inducements to public officials or their family members. Corporate members should not indulge in casual communications involving unpublished price-sensitive information. Then, appropriate KYC for third-party vendors and agents is also very important. Corporates are recommended to adopt contractual protection against risks of bribery and money laundering. So to conclude, uh, the instance of white-collar crimes, prevention really is better than the cure. Frequent and regular audits can be of immense help in this regard, as well as help keep the organization focused on the goal of minimizing non-compliance risk. However, in the unfortunate happenstance of a company finding itself in crosshairs of the regulator, effective and timely counsel go a long way in minimizing further damage to business and reputation. Thank you. I would now invite my colleagues from Norris McLaughlin and Marcus to share their perspectives on white collar issues. Over to Norris McLaughlin. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll start with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which uh, is probably the first thing that comes to mind when people think about uh, business relations between two different countries are uh, starting to do business in, in India or anywhere else. Um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is the United States ban on bribing officials of foreign governments. It's codified in the Security Exchange Act of 1934, one of the two main U.S. securities regulatory statutes. Uh, it has two parts, the anti-bribery provisions and the books and records and internal control provisions. Very briefly mentioned in the latter, the record-keeping provisions broadly require maintenance of books and records reflecting transactions and dispositions of all assets in detail. They also require all issuers to devise and maintain a system of internal accounting controls sufficient to provide reasonable assurances that transactions are properly authorized, recorded, and accounted for. These provisions can be violated by conduct that has nothing to do with corruption or bribery, including, for example, the misstatement of uh, pre-tax income or the like, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit later. <laughs> Um, the anti-bribery provisions, which is probably what more people are, are familiar with, um, prohibit actual promised or authorized payments of anything of value directly or indirectly to a foreign government official with the intent to influence an official act, violate an official duty, or use his or her influence to assist the bribe payer in obtaining any improper business advantage. The anti-bribery provisions apply to all issuers, any domestic concern, in any person while acting in the territory of the United States. An issuer is a company that files reports to the SEC or trades equities on a U.S. exchange. A domestic concern is a U.S. citizen, national, resident, or entity organized under U.S. law or having a principal place of business here in the United States. Um, and the person acting in the territory of the United States is defined quite broadly. Um, these definitions also, all of them include the conduct of any employee, subsidiary, shareholder, distributor, joint venture partner, or other third party uh, that a company may be doing business with. This is an important point. Because liability exists merely for authorizing a payment uh, and not just for making a payment, and because liability may extend to conduct of distributors or other business partners, 
companies need to do their due diligence on any companies or business partners or third parties that they're doing business with um, in India or in any other country and be sure to account for all money flowing to those entities and through those entities um, potentially to the government. Note also that these definitions uh, don't just uh, apply to U.S. entities. Some of the largest FCPA cases have been brought against non-United States corporations. For example, in 2008, Siemens AG, a German company, uh, and three of its subsidiaries pled guilty and agreed to pay uh, $450 million in criminal fines. They wound up paying a total of $1.6 billion in penalties between criminal fines paid to the Department of Justice, civil fines paid to the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the fines they wound up paying to German authorities as well. This is one of the largest FCPA settlements ever, and again, that's a non-United States company. Um, by contrast, the exceptions to the FCPA are very narrow. Uh, a facilitating payment is one made for the purpose of expediting or securing the performance of a routine government action by a foreign official. Uh, think, for example, of getting someone to stamp a passport. This might not be a proper payment, but if it's the, just the way things are done, uh, then sometimes you have to do it. Um, also, a promotional payment is a bona fide expenditure for travel or lodging paid to a foreign official for promoting, demonstrating, or explaining a company's products or for performing a contract with the government. For this one, think about a defense contractor paying for a military official to fly somewhere for a demonstration of a new system. It's important to note here that because almost all FCPA cases are settled with the Department of Justice or the Securities and Exchange Commission without a case ever being brought to court, these agencies' interpretation of the statute are of paramount importance. They take these narrow exceptions and interpret them in a very limited way and in some cases of broad enforcement actions against companies based on conduct that would arguably be covered by one of these exceptions. So companies shouldn't rely on these exceptions to the extent they don't have to. Also be aware that government official is defined very broadly under this statute. It does not include only those you would expect, like tax and customs officials uh, or government officials responsible for doling out contracts and the like. It also includes uh, any officer or employee foreign government or any department, agency, or instrumentality thereof, or of a public international organization, or any person acting in an official capacity for or on behalf of any such government or department, agency, or instrumentality. Again, there are almost no reported judicial decisions on this point. Uh, there is one uh, appellate level decision uh, but not Supreme Court decision in 2014 that found a telecommunications service provider uh, in Haiti was an instrument of the Haitian government because that provider was controlled by the government and had a monopoly on telecommunication services in the country granted by the government. And as a result, any payments made to any uh, employee of that uh, telecommunication service provider were considered uh, for the purposes of the FCPA. Again, here the enforcement agencies that I mentioned before, uh, interpretation is important uh, in, in the presence of or in the, with the lack of any judicial interpretation of the statute. And these agencies take a very aggressive interpretation of government official. They take that term to include uh, any employee of a state-controlled health care system, like a doctor, nurse, or pharmacist. In fact, nearly half of all FCPA corporate enforcement actions in recent years have been based on this enforcement theory. So companies should be especially careful with, uh, for example, any promotional activities uh, in countries with government health care systems or uh, doctors that receive a, a substantial portion of their income from government health care systems. The enforcement agencies also take the position that employees of state-owned enterprises, regardless of those enterprises' function, are foreign officials. This will include any state-owned media outlets, the telecommunications company I mentioned earlier, uh, sovereign wealth fund managers, uh, and, and as many of you might know, pretty much any company in China. Um, the bottom line is to keep control of expenditures of all employees and keep track of all money flowing through not just your own company but any business partners. Uh, you need to be aware not only of payments to tax or customs officials but also expenditures on travel or entertainment. Um, all right. On the same note, there's also a number of uh, domestic laws that cover bribery or payments to government officials here in the United States. Um, I list them here. Uh, 
this kind of payment could implicate bribery and gratuity statute, the program bribery statute, the U.S. mail and wire fraud statutes, and at least for the public official taking the bribe, but not necessarily the bribe payer, uh, the part of the Hobbs Act that prohibits extortion. Each statute differs slightly in the proof required. For example, bribery under Section 201 requires the general intent that uh, the exchange of a thing of value be made in agreement with uh, the official and connected to an official act of fraud in the United States or a violation of a public duty. Uh, a gratuity under Section 201, on the other hand, is illegal when it's merely for or because of an official act. So it may be a reward for past behavior or if it's connected uh, to an official act. Program bribery prohibits the bribe payer's corrupt intent merely to influence or reward a public official, which is even broader, but on the other hand, it's limited to payments valued over $5,000. Uh, similar to the FCPA, you don't need to just get caught giving a suitcase full of money to be found guilty under any of these. I'll just give an example. Um, in one case recently in 2011, uh, uh, Sanjay Bahel was prosecuted um, and, and there's a reported decision in the Second Circuit for that prosecution. A uh, note that these also cover international organizations. So this uh, gentleman was an employee at the United Nations. He was a procurement official, and he helped a friend win over $100 million in United Nations contracts. Uh, not only was he receiving a kickback, but he also received first-class plane tickets to India, seats at the U.S. Open, and a steeply discounted Manhattan apartment. He wound up being sentenced to eight years in jail when he was found guilty uh, of four counts of uh, honest services, mail and wire fraud, and one count of program bribery. So again, just things to be aware of as you start to do business here in the U.S. Uh, now uh, Ed Sponzilli will discuss money laundering. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm, gonna speak in, I'm gonna be speaking about money laundering in the United States. Money laundering generally refers to an actor's efforts to conceal the nature of the proceeds of a criminal venture in order to make those proceeds look legitimate. Essentially, you are trying to cleanse the money of its criminal origin. Again, this is an area where state and federal laws overlap. As states have their own money laundering statutes, which generally track the federal criminal statute, but have some nuances, which may make them more expansive than their federal counterpart. Under U.S. law, there is no double jeopardy prohibition if an individual or business is prosecuted at both levels. Generally, though, state and federal investigators will deconflict for resource allocation purposes so that they are not both working the same case, or if they are, that the matter will be prosecuted in one forum, either federal or state court. The larger the matter, whether in terms of the number of victims or the size of the alleged financial fraud, the more likely that the federal investigators will take the lead. But that does not mean that both entities may not choose to prosecute. To combat money laundering, the federal government also has in place the Bank Secrecy Act, which requires federal institutions to undertake certain anti-money laundering efforts known in the industry as AML. Financial institutions will often hire former financial fraud investigators and former prosecutors in the private sector to implement with police and police internal procedures to prevent, uh, prevent conduct that may result in criminal liability. The Bank Secrecy Act requires that financial institutions file currency transaction reports, known as CTRs, for $10,000 or larger transactions, and suspicious activity reports, or SARs, for transactions of $5,000 or more that are suspicious. The SARs focus on potentially nefarious transactions that appear to involve laundering money from illegal activities. The SARs are frequently utilized by federal and state investigators and oftentimes provide key information upon which criminal investigations are built. 
Money laundering is often a tag-along criminal charge, which will follow other financial fraud-related charges. Bribery of politicians for contracts or, pre or preferential treatment, drug trafficking, organized crime, money used to fund terrorist activities are all criminal antecedents for money laundering. At the end of the day, to combat money laundering within your own company, you need to implement a system of internal controls, policies, and procedures to identify and investigate suspicious internal activities and money transfers. This includes hiring competent and experienced individuals to manage your corporate compliance programs and to invest in appropriate technology to allow you to track financial and operational data. Money laundering concerns are also another reason to properly vet your business partners. Do not go into any new business venture relationship blind. I'm now going to turn uh, the speaker platform over to Brad Muller. Thanks, Ed. Today I'm going to cover first liability for corporate and individual uh, employees. In the U.S., a corporation can be held liable for the crimes and regulatory violations that its employees or agents commit on its behalf that are within the employees or agents' scope of employment or agency. As the U.S. employs a federal structure, corporations and employees face potential criminal prosecution or civil penalties at the federal, state, or even local level. Thus, for an incoming foreign corporation, you need to be aware of not just the potential for investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice and uh, various federal regula uh, regulatory agencies such as the SEC, but also investigations of violations led by the uh, state attorneys general, state regulatory agencies, and even county prosecutors or district attorneys. As far as corporate liability goes, if a corporation is found to have violated a law or regulation, it could face criminal probation and monitoring requirements civil penalties or criminal fines, restitution orders, debarment or suspension from state or federal programs, or even the corporate equivalent of the death penalty. Uh, that is what Arthur Anderson faced following the Enron debacle in the early 2000s when their licensing was pulled and the accounting company was effectively shut down by the federal government as a result of their uh, activities with Enron. On the employee liability side, corporate officers, employees, and agents are individually liable for the crimes or civil wrongs they commit on behalf of their corporate employer, and of course, they're also liable for any crimes they commit uh, for their own benefit. Increasing pressure on federal investigators following the 2008 financial crisis has led to intensified focus on employee liability. This new focus is perhaps best personified in the September 2015 memorandum from uh, U.S. Deputy Attorney General Sally Quillen Yates, which is titled The Individual Accountability for Corporate Wrongdoing. A memorandum. Uh, th this document lays out six measures that federal investigators are to implement going forward when investigating and punishing employee wrongdoing. Uh, first, corporations under investigation must now provide all relevant facts relating to the individuals involved in the alleged corporate misconduct in order to receive any cooperation credit whatsoever from the federal government. Second, the DOJ is to focus on individuals from the inception of its corporate investigations, not uh, not towards the end. Third, there's to be increased communication between Department of Justice criminal and civil attorneys. Fourth, in most circumstances, the Department of Justice will no longer release individuals from liability when resolving a matter with a corporation. They want uh, the individual and corporate liabilities to be resolved globally now. Fifth, Department of Justice attorneys who resolve corporate matters uh, as a result, should also have a plan to resolve ind individual-related cases. And six, uh, DOJ civil attorneys should base their decision to sue on factors beyond whether or not the individual employee actually has the ability to pay the requested fines. Thus, it's no longer federal investigators' prime objective to recover record amounts of money from corporations, but rather to seek accountability from those individual employees within the corporations who violated the law. Next, briefly discuss insider trading. Insider trading in the United States is a topic that could take a, a full week's worth of seminars, so I'll, I'll try to cover the main points. 
Insider trading generally refers to buying or selling a security in breach of a fiduciary duty or other relationship of trust and confidence while in possession of material, non-public information about the security. Insider trading in the U.S. is governed by court opinions which interpret Sections 10B and 14E of the SEC Act, SEC Rules 10B-5 and 14E-3, and certain provisions of the Starbanes-Oxley Act, which was passed following the Enron debacle in the early 2000s. There are three major theories of insider trading, the classical theory, the misappropriation theory, and the related tipper tippy theory. Briefly, the classical theory, which is embodied in the Chiarella v. United States case and its progeny, addresses when a corporate ins insider violates a duty to corporate shareholders to abstain from trading on the basis of material non-public information. The misappropriation theory bars trading or tipping by those who misappropriate material non-public information based on the breach of a pre-existing relationship of trust and confidence owed by the trader or tipper to the source of the confidential information. Thus, the misappropriation theory covers people who are not corporate insiders, but who seek to profit by taking sensitive information from those with whom they share, for example, an employment or familial relationship. One of the key cases in this area was United States v. O'Hagan. Finally, the seminal tipper to be case was Dirks v. SEC. In Dirks, the Supreme Court premised tippy liability on the motives of the tipper. Thus, the tippy, who is the person receiving the material non-public information about the corporation, uh, is only under a duty to disclose or abstain when the tipper, who is the person sharing the material non-public information, uh, seeks an improper benefit for this info. So where the tipper acts from a purely altruistic motive, there could be, under Dirks, no liability. But defining the contours of tipper to be liability is an ongoing judicial issue. Uh, a recent opinion called the United States v. Salmon, which was decided in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, upheld the conviction where the tipper, again, the person who was sharing the inside information, only intended to benefit his brother, the tippy, by providing him with a gift of this highly sensitive inside info. The circuit court found that it is illegal insider trading if an insider discloses inside information with the intent to benefit a family member or friend even if he does not receive a pecuniary benefit or other quid pro quo benefit. Just a few weeks ago, the U.S. Supreme Court granted certiorari of the Salmon case, so hopefully we'll be able to have more clarity as far as the true reach of tip or tippy liability. So with that, I'll now turn the presentation over to Melinda. Thanks, Brad. So um, up to now, my colleagues have been talking about money laundering and other issues essentially surrounding reporting of money, um, what they're doing with money and so forth. Um, and what I'm going to address is potential ways to fix problems about uh, under-reporting of tax, under-reporting of income, and so forth. So you really have to look back to 2009 for this, which is when the United States turned up its efforts to mitigate these types of issues with taxpayers' problems with offshore compliance. Um, since 2009, what's the, the hot topic that's really um, formed the focus of all of this is the FBAR, the Foreign Bank Account Reports, which are now known as the FinCEN 114, which is filed electronically. And these are reports that a taxpayer needs to file when they own assets in the aggregate, financial assets in the aggregate abroad, exceeding $10,000. Um, now, what's interesting to me as a practitioner is, this is really, the heat on this has really only turned up since 2009, but these requir requirements have been around since 1970. So, um, interesting that it took so long for it to all heat up. So when a taxpayer comes in to meet with me today as a tax professional to talk about these issues of compliance, you're really talking about the informational reporting aspect of this and the actual tax reporting. Um, and uh, this, this topic is really timely, too, for um, our clients with accounts in India and who reside in India now, now that India signed an intergovernmental agreement with the IRS to exchange information. So, Really, the, the central point of all of this is the Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program. 
which started, as I said, um, back in 2009. That was really the first iteration of this. And that program um, essentially presupposed that a taxpayer entering into it acted willfully, meaning they intentionally violated their known legal duty to either report accounts, report offshore income, and so forth. Um, so, and we'll focus on that aspect of willfulness in a bit with the newer program. So in the 2009 program, essentially, the penalty amount was 20%, meaning a taxpayer entering the program in 2009 had to pay an asset-based penalty of 20% of the highest aggregate balance in their offshore accounts for the preceding six years. They had an asset-based penalty, and they also had an income-based penalty. The income-based penalty was for the last six years before they entered the program to pay the underreported tax, meaning whatever tax should have been paid on these offshore assets, plus interest and penalties. So two-pronged two penalty there. Um, as well as taxpayer had to amend their returns for those years, file the informational reports and other such um, informational reports, such as um, an asset report, a penalty sheet, and um, an agreement to extend the statute of limitations on assessment. For that, in 2009, a taxpayer would be offered freedom from any and all criminal prosecution by the IRS. So sort of a, a large price tag to pay for that. Um, that price tag went up in, in sooner. So we started with the 2009 form of the program. In 2011, that asset-based penalty that I mentioned went up to 25%. And now it's in its cur current version, the 2012 program, the asset-based penalty is now 27.5%. Okay all focusing on that willfulness concept. So this is really the, the program for the taxpayer who um, doesn't think that their acts were negligent, so to speak. You know, they're worried that there is some evidence that perhaps the IRS could find that they did know that they should have filed these reports or paid the tax. And that really is the critical distinction, in my view, between these offshore voluntary disclosure programs, and now what's currently offered as an alternative, which is the streamlined program, which is offered both to um, folks who live here in the United States as well as U.S. citizens who are living abroad. Um, the streamlined program for people who live here, so the streamlined domestic offshore program, the extent that a taxpayer can prove that their acts were not willful, which is proven in an affidavit that I draft, essentially, and submit with old returns as well as those FinCEN 114s, the penalty now goes down to 5% for those taxpayers. Um, taxpayers living abroad um, who have um, satisfied certain residency requirements, um, generally one year out of the last three, are now eligible for the streamlined program where there is no asset-based penalty. So this is really a big um, development for people who want to come forward and fix their returns. Obviously, 5% or 0% as opposed to 27.5% is huge, recognizing that it doesn't, you know, the taxpayer who considers applying to this program really has to fit into that non-willful criteria and be willing to sign a statement under penalties of perjury that their acts were not willful. Um, there are also two other sort of collateral programs that are being offered now for taxpayers who don't have underreported income, whose failure to file was only informational, such as the failure to file the FinCEN 114 that I mentioned, or to report certain holdings in offshore companies which is a Form 5471 here in the U.S., those types of failures can be cured with no penalty. Again, very fact-specific, um, and it depends on the situation for the particular taxpayer. You know, of course, you have the option to, you know, not do anything and not come into any of these programs. 
and certainly taxpayers have the option to do that, or certain taxpayers are doing what is known as a quiet disclosure and simply not entering one of these programs that I mentioned formally, but going back and um, amending returns and just filing them on their own with the IRS, of course, which has certain perils and pitfalls to it as well, but it is an option. And that's really the landscape of issues that are available here in the U.S. Thanks. Thank you, Melinda. This, this really has been quite an insightful um, exchange of uh, views. Let us now move on to the next segment of this webinar, which is the Q&A session with the panel uh, panelists that uh, we see on the screen right now. So let me kick this off with the first question to Sushmit. Sushmit, under India's uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, can property be attached without any investigation? And if so, what are the kinds of assets that can be attached by the enforcement agencies? Uh, so, Ashutosh, uh, to answer the first question, the Enforcement Directorate under PMLA has the power to attach proceeds of crime, uh, which, in their opinion, are likely to be concealed or transferred or dealt with any any other manner. But they have to form a view that not attaching the proceeds of crime will result in frustrating any proceedings relating to confiscation of such proceeds of crime. Uh, so to answer your first question, the directorate can provisionally attach suspected proceeds of crime. Normally, however, any attachment is likely to happen only after a charge sheet is filed in respect of uh, the predicate scheduled offense or if a complaint has been filed in respect thereof by the investigating officer for taking cognizance. Uh, basically, normally when the investigation has proceeded to some extent and there is a prima facie view that there is uh, the offense of money laundering, then they proceed to attach. From a risk standpoint, there is a definite risk that companies' valuable property can be provisionally attached even before a formal investigation begins. And to answer your second question, uh, the PMLA attachment really means a prohibition of transfer, conversion, disposition, or movement of property. It provides that property can include, as I said earlier, uh, any property or assets of every description, movable, immovable, tangible, or intangible, even titles, title documents, or deeds that uh, evidence um, uh, the title or interest in any such property can be attached. Property in itself can be located anywhere, and uh, what the sweep of what property can be attached is very wide, an attachment will render commercial transaction impossible in that property. So that basically answers your second question as well. In our experience, the ED is making some unusually very high attachments in the past six to 12 months. Thank you. Uh, Ed, does the US assert jurisdiction over money laundering where the illegal activity occurred outside of the United States? Uh, thank you, Ashu, for the uh, question. Yes, the federal money laundering statute gives the United States government very wide authority to police any activity that qualifies as money laundering involving individuals or business entities such as corporations acting anywhere in the world. The statute gives the Department of Justice broad authority to bring a case wherever it finds a party entered into a, quote, financial transaction, unquote, as part of a money laundering scheme, the geographic location of the transaction notwithstanding. The statute extends jurisdiction to the case as long as the target is a U.S. citizen or the transaction involves a sufficient U.S. nexus, specifically pursuant to 18 United States Code Section 1956F, there is extraterritorial jurisdiction if, one, the conduct is by a United States citizen, or in the case of a non-United States citizen, the conduct occurs in part in the United States, and the transaction or series of related transactions involve 
funds or monetary instruments of a value exceeding $10,000? I hope that responds to your question. It does. Uh, thank you. Next question is for you, Nick. Uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction is really a, is a real question when dealing with an FCPA prosecution. Can you explain for us how much of a nexus there must be between the U.S. and the target of the FCPA investigation in order for the jurisdictional element to be met? Sure. Thanks, Ashu. Uh, it's important to remember that the extraterritorial reach of the FCPA is extremely broad. The nexus uh, can be very thin, to say the least. Um, in, in fact, in one case, the connection to the United States uh, was as limited as sending an email in furtherance of an FCPA scheme that happened to pass through a U.S. server. Um, of course, this is limited by the general principles in, in U.S. courts of personal jurisdiction over a defendant, um, meaning that a, a defendant has to have some minimal contacts with the United States to be subject to United States law. Um, so, for example, in, in one of the prosecutions of individuals involved in the Siemens case, uh, the court found that the president of the Siemens uh, Argentine subsidiary was not subject to U.S. jurisdiction when he authorized bribes uh, that ultimately resulted in false SEC filings, but had nothing to do with the United States other than sort of his tangential relationship to those SEC filings. Um, and I'll just mention more broadly uh, with pretty much any of the statutes that cover the behavior we're talking about, the uh, U.S. Is, is going to look to apply its law uh, with as thin a nexus as possible. I should say the enforcement agencies will try a prosecution uh, based on very thin circumstances. For example, uh, in, in a recent prosecution for um, a mortgage-backed securities fraud scheme against a somewhat infamous Goldman Sachs trader named Fabrice Touré, uh, the nexus to the United States was simply the fact that the trades in question, the short sales, uh, were stamped with uh, Goldman Sachs' uh, address on, the, on the, uh, the transaction confirmations. Everything else, the trades and, and all the other behavior happened outside the United States. So the nexus can be very small, to say the least. Got it. Thank, uh, thank you uh, for, for your response. Uh, Anand, the next question is for you. Can a non-executive director not in charge and not responsible for the company's business be held liable for fraud in India? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ashu. Uh, this response uh, needs to be looked from a few angles. First, if the director concern is involved absolutely directly in the fraud, he would be liable. Where there is evidence that the director played an active role and possessed guilty intent. In other cases where he is not directly involved, he needs to demonstrate that acts of omission or commission had occurred without his knowledge. Secondly, in case of corporate criminal liability, the concerned director will be liable where the law deems vicarious liability on persons for wrong done by the company. For example, in environmental and labor laws, it's very specifically provided that the company and the people in charge, including the directors, are liable. Thirdly, in case the concern statute does not specify the manner of imputing liability, evidence of active wrongdoing on part of that director who is in the non-executive position will have to be proved for liability of fraud. This is really, in a sense, the issues around uh, you know, the liability of, for non-executive directors. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Anand. Sure. Uh, Melinda, what impact do you think the recent intergovernmental agreement between India and the U.S. Uh, might have on offshore reporting issues? I'll tell you, since the signing of that agreement in October, I have uh, gotten a lot of calls, a lot more calls than usual. I represent a lot of people who have offshore accounts in India and also quite a few people who are of uh, Indian descent who reside here now. And I can tell you that the passing of the agreement is definitely going to increase, I believe, the amount of people participating in various programs just by virtue of the fact that India 
is now under an obligation to exchange the information with the U.S. due to the agreement. Thank you. Uh, next question is for you, Brad. Uh, insider trading seems to be a problem that is difficult for a corporation to police. What are some of the best practices that you suggest the company adopt to combat insider trading? Thanks. And again, this is a topic that you could spend a day on, but a few of the things that larger companies do is they uh, implement employee training programs in order to embed in the employees' minds the contours of insider trading, the seriousness of it, the ramifications, and the company's policies and procedures regarding it. Um, another thing that, if, if it's a publicly traded company that you know, could be implemented, is a blackout period for key insiders, uh, where they have to forbear from trading in company securities during, uh, for example, quarterly earnings release seasons and during various ad hoc periods when news of important events or other material non-public information regarding the company is anticipated to be disclosed but has not yet reached the uh, public domain. Uh, but I think the most important thing is, again, to embed within the company a culture where employees do not play fast and loose with inside information. It's, you, know, you have to embed in them that they're not going to be discussing material inside info at uh, cocktail parties and, and uh, other events. Thank you. Um, so, Schmidt, let me ask the next question of you. Can a foreign principal outside India be roped in cases uh, uh, alleging corruption? Uh, so, to answer that question, uh, Ashu, say if the subject matter, say a government contract or license pertains to India, and the allegation of corruption is in that regard, say procurement or the performance or payments made under that contract, the investigating agencies here typically allege criminal conspiracy, uh, including against foreign principals and or an Indian agent. So the agencies then extradite foreign nationals and take actions under the treaties uh, to bring them to India for investigation and trial in Indian courts. Uh, recent cases, there have been recent cases where the agencies have investigated uh, foreign offshore agents acting as intermediaries. Uh, involved in bribing public officials in India. So uh, foreign nationals can be investigated for bribery uh, in India, and uh, there are several cases that are currently going on where the prosecuting agencies are going after uh, foreign foreign entities and foreign nationals. I hope that answers the question, Ashu. It does. Uh, thank you. There have been uh, recent reports on U.S. lawyers being used to help facilitate international money laundering, cleaning ill-gotten foreign gains by helping foreign nationals purchase assets in the U.S. Ed, as a veteran attorney, what should lawyers try to want to know from prospective clients to avoid being made an instrument in a money laundering scheme? Uh, thank you for the question. Let me approach it this way. As attorneys, we have both legal and ethical obligations to ensure that we do not advise a client on how to commit a crime or on how to avoid getting caught, nor do we want to be an aider and a better or a conspirator in a criminal enterprise. The most important inquiry is where did the money come from which the client or its agent wants to invest in the United States? What does the potential client seek to do with the money? Does it appear that the client is trying to hide the source of the money or how it was obtained? I also want to know something about the client and the client's business and source of the funds to be invested. In the uh, CBS television show, 60 Minutes, which is an investigative uh, show, it had a piece just recently on money laundering, where 16 law firms in Manhattan were visited by an investigator posing as an agent from a foreign national who wanted to make substantial purchases in the United States with what on its face appeared to be money obtained from bribes. Only one of the 16 firms flatly turned down the supposed client and to varying degrees, others expressed concerns, 
was one even indicating that if he learned of a plan to commit a crime, he was legally obligated to report it. Consequently, I think this investigation disclosed some of the problems that we face as attorneys. You have to assess the client, its credibility, and be attentive to any red flags before you become involved. You have to do due diligence on your potential client. I think in this way, you can avoid uh, the pitfalls that the 60 Minutes uh, program uh, demonstrated. And thank you again for the question. Well, well thanks for that uh, response, Ed. Um, Anand, uh, let me ask the next question of you. Regarding insider trading regulations in India, is it a good defense to say that the sensitive information is available to a group of people and therefore not unpublished information? Thanks, Ashu. Uh, you know, as you are aware, the new regulations provide that any information pertaining to the company or its securities is generally not available, is unpublished price sensitive information. So this, in fact, uh, does pro sorry, this does not provide any uh, bright line test. Generally, available information is defined to mean very loosely information that is available to public on a non-discriminatory basis. So you, actually, if you see the new regulations, they do not deal with this issue at all. But it cannot be ruled out that the information available is to a particular group of individuals uh, may still be categorized as unpublished price sensitive information. That's really the way to look at it. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, we are running out of time now, and uh, let me just take this opportunity to thank everyone for their time today. In case um, you have any thoughts or queries, please feel uh, free to reach out to any of the presenters. And uh, we now conclude this webinar. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much, Ashu, and thank you very much, each of you, um, for taking the time to present today and for the um, attendees. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Ashu mentioned, I will send out a communication here in the next few days that will include the um, slides, a recording of the webinar, and each of the presenters' contact details. Feel free to reach out to them if you have any further questions. Um, with that, Thank you again for taking the time to join us, and I hope everyone has a great day. Goodbye.